Jesus, you rescue us from the snare. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ Jesus, you cleanse us of all impurity. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you give us a new spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Dear many God, have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to the lasting life. Amen. Amen. And let us pray. For God, author of every mercy and of all goodness, who in fasting, prayer, and almsgiving have shown us a remedy for sin, look graciously on this confession of our lowliness, that we who are bowed down by our conscience may always be lifted up by your mercy. To our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, Jews and Greeks alike, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In our first reading from the book of Exodus, we hear how the people of Israel have received the commandments. Uh, built, of course, a 
upon the natural law, they receive the law of the covenant in order for them to always remain faithful and to know of God's blessings and that, that the world would know that this is truly the children of God, that they kept these rules. And I always find during the season of Lent that this is a great opportunity to kind of re reflect on the Ten Commandments, sort of a way of a, a self-examination of conscience. So if you have that opportunity to do that this week, just kind of look through that. It's a, an awesome way to just kind of say, okay, how, how am I doing and with all of the different meanings and purposes of each law. Um, one of the great avenues to do that um, is to open up the old Catechism of the Catholic Church. It has about four chapters worth of just definitions of just the laws themselves, the commandments, and how it unfolds in the Christian and Catholic life. Now knowing that this reading was about the commandments, and knowing that in the very near future we'll be celebrating St. Patrick's Day, I had to take this opportunity to share with you another commandment called St. Murphy's Commandment. Have you ever heard of it? It goes like this. Anything a preacher says that can be misunderstood will be misunderstood. <laughs> I share that with you because over the last 30 years of preaching, uh, I'm amazed how many people will come up to me years later after a homily that was given. I said, Father Mark, the homily you gave changed my life. And I said, oh, really? What was it about? And I went into it. I never remember preaching that homily. And of course, over a period of time, you kind of realize, I do anyway, that it was a different Father Mark. <laughs> Don't share that part, right? But there's a great ability to recognize that when we receive the Word of God, whether in our reading, whether it being given to us, the Word of God is alive. And the Holy Spirit gives us this great understanding and insight that what I hear, what you hear, what you hear might be different, even in the same passage being read to you. Because of the living Word of God taking part in your lives, it takes root in it. So whatever you're experiencing right now, when you hear the word of God, you do hear it differently. Now, as you know, our scripture readings over the course of three years, uh, we go in three different cycles on the weekend and then two different cycles for every other year on the weekday readings. But every three, one, two, three, every fourth year, you get the same reading we had here this evening. So, you know, the last time this was done, in the readings, I had the homework. And do you remember the homework? <laughs> there was a four o'clock match. Oh yeah, we remember. <laughs> it was one of my favorite homilies to do. I had a whole barrel of bags of cotton candy. And I went in and reenacted what Jesus did in the temple, and I started flying the cotton candy. You remember that? Yeah. 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 I think there's still a bag in that light up there. <laughs> <laughs> Back and forth. It was great, I thought. So, let me put what? Well, no, I was on the four o'clock mass. They wanted the bag of cotton candy. I said, I can't. We can't. We can't touch things until this virus is gone. So. But if you look in your Bibles later on, in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you will see that this event happens near the end of Jesus' ministry. However, in John's Gospel, which we just heard, it takes place at the beginning of his ministry. For John, 
This story is about Jesus challenging the very authority of the temple and also presenting his authority as superior. So the ultimate question just has to be for us, why was Jesus angry? Is it because the merchants were selling sacrificial animals? No, they were supposed to. Was it because the merchants were turning secular money into temple money? No, after all, this was the only way for the Jewish people to pay their temple tax. So why was Jesus angry? He was mad because of the whole situation, the marketplace, the temple taxation, the purity of unblemished animals to use for the sacrifice, the attitude of the people. It became a place of gossip, of sitting around and watching who came to town, or who was leaving the town, or who got arrested. It was a place of public hangout and it had lost its original purpose and meaning. It was supposed to be the place where people who sought out the presence of God would find it. So Jesus declares that his body is now the new temple, the body of Christ. So when I threw the cotton candy, it was meant for you to think about Jesus simply just losing it in order for all of us to take special notice. He was cleaning out. Think what we do every spring. It's hard to imagine springs around the corner with the weather we're having. But it is around the corner, and every spring we do spring cleaning, whether in the garage or in our homes, our closets. Well, Lent is also a time for us to do the same thing with our spiritual lives. So we have to ask ourselves this week, what needs to be cleaned out? What is getting in our way of recognizing the presence of God within the temple of the Holy Spirit? You know, the temple of the Holy Spirit is our own bodies. By our baptism, the Holy Spirit resides in us, the body of Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ. What habits, feelings, emotions, sins, memories, etc., need to be cleaned out this night? Our first reading from Exodus is really an awesome examination of the conscience. Like I said earlier, it's a great opportunity to just review them. Whatever I say will probably be misunderstood. The Holy Spirit will take over and speak to us directly, even if it feels foolish to us. So may we be fools for the sake of Jesus, and know that the renewal and life that only such foolishness can bring. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Who the Father, Son, and Lord, and glorified, who has spoken to the Father. 
Christ be just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for you will that our self-denial should give you thanks, humble our sinful pride, contribute to the feeding of the poor, and so help us imitate you in your kindness. And so we glorify you with countless angels, as with one voice of praise we are pledged. <laughs> In a similar way, when supper was ended, knowing that he was about to reconcile all things to himself, and his blood was shed on the cross, he took the chalice, filled with the fruit of the vine, and once more giving you thanks, handed the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, follow me, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Blessed Apostles, 
and all the saints with our deceased brothers and sisters whom we humbly commend to your mercy. Then, freed at last from the wound of corruption and made fully into a new creation, we shall sing to you with gladness the thanksgiving of Christ who lives for all eternity. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. safer, um, where we're not all going out the door at the same time. So we're going to be doing the closing prayer and the closing rites, and after which Deacon Steve and myself will be placing our face mask on, purifying our hands, and then offering you the Eucharist. So as you come to the center aisle, to the front, to receive the Eucharist, stop at the last blue line that's in the aisle, and just take off your mask at that point. 
So that way there, you're not receiving the Eucharist and trying to do two things at once. Once you receive the Eucharist, simply place your mask back on. You're welcome to stay and pray as long as you want, or you're welcome to go and enjoy your evening of a mass with the Holy Spirit. So let us stand for our closing prayer. Let us pray as we receive the pledge of things yet hidden in heaven and are nourished while still on earth with the bread that comes from on high. We humbly entreat you, O Lord, that what is being brought about in us in mystery may come to true completion through Christ our Lord. Amen. My brothers and sisters, may the Lord be with you. May God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go and proclaim the gospel with your life.